I, I've always I've always wanted to do a, a lesson about Goshen because I, I find I find it fascinating how how God separates his people and I don't know why it's taken so long to finally bring this lesson but you know recently if about I think maybe three weeks ago we talked about the the mountain of God Mount Zion uh, Sinai or uh, Mount Zion God's people and and this uh, New Testament application to it we talked about how Moses was told not to come near to this burning bush. That's where it started. You remember, take off your sandals for you're on holy ground. And then we came back to the mountain of God after God had freed his people. They're back on Mount Horeb, back at Mount Sinai, this mountain of God. And now he gives them their law in this fascinating but, but very scary scene. What we're going to do this morning is we're going to go back to the time in between. Moses was 40 years old whenever he left Egypt. He remained in Midian for an additional 40 years. He's 80 years old. And it is at this point that God is going to call him back to Egypt to free his people. And his people, again, are in Goshen. So if we rewind we will remember that Joseph was sold by his brothers. You remember that. He finds himself in Egypt, long story short, becomes Pharaoh's right-hand man. God blesses Joseph. Joseph is granted to bring his family, Jacob, and all the brothers and wives and children, grandchildren, all of them back now to Egypt to Goshen. It is the best land. Matter of fact, it's where Pharaoh had his livestock, and it was very close to, to the royal palace. This is, this is the good stuff, the good place. This is where you want to be. These people have been there for hundreds of years. A new Pharaoh is in town now. All these people, the, the originals, if you will, they've been dead for a long, long time. And now God's people have multiplied, and the Pharaoh is nervous about this. And he ends up having the, the first, uh, any male child killed, if you remember that. That happened. Uh, you'll also remember um, um, at, at this point, uh, oh, excuse me. We're, we're going to see here in just a moment, I'll kind of tie into together, but I, I think it's kind of interesting how um, Israel's, uh, male children were, were killed in the threat that God will bring to, uh, to Pharaoh right off the bat. But as it is, he's going to go back, and this is where God's people are in Goshen living there. Okay, so God sends Moses back, and he tells Moses before he leaves that I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt And with all the wonders that I will do in it, after that he will let you go. God has heard the cries of his people. He has remembered his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You remember Moses didn't want to go, but God's charged him with this. He and his brother Aaron are going to go back. Um, The Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh... Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn firstborn son. And sure enough, God's going to end up keeping to his word. This ends up being the tenth plague throughout the whole land. I also want you to take note, if you will, right at the beginning of this, God first told Moses that Pharaoh was not going to listen to him. I already know he's not going to listen to him, but I'm going to free my people. Now, is it, whenever you're seeing that Pharaoh's uh, heart is going to be hardened by God. And I want you to take note, as a side note, in your studies, that this is used interchangeably. God hardens his heart, Pharaoh hardens his heart. But it started with God saying that he just wouldn't listen. Now, Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, 
Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord. And more, moreover, I will not let Israel go. Matter of fact, this, this week, just coincidence, I was talking to a guy that gets coffee every day where I go, and uh, he was talking about his, the passing of his father, and he was telling me that uh, towards the end of that time, he tried to talk to his father about Jesus, and he told his son, who is Jesus? Uh, this, this question, this mentality is nothing new, and it didn't only happen back then. Well, Exodus chapter 5, 4 through 9, But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are now many, and make them rest from their burden. The same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, You shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks, as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But, he says, they're going to continue to perform just like they had before. Same amount of bricks. Let heavier work be laid on the men that they may labor at it, and pay no atten- uh, pay regard to their lying. Don't listen to them. And so this ends up frustrating the Hebrew congregation. Matter of fact, it, it worries Moses. <laughs> he goes on behalf to the Lord. Things are not looking like they should. And here's the Lord's answer. I'm the Lord. Chapter 6, verse 6. And I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into a land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. You're going to keep his promise. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because their broken spirit and harsh slavery. And so it is today. Let me just say as a side note, that God makes these wonderful promises, and He does. God has promises, and He keeps His promises. But because of life and because men look to other people and not to God, they find these promises hard to believe. And they're broken in spirit, and they're worn down by the slavery, the darkness, of Satan. But we got to rise above that, brethren. Well, so what ends up happening? Moses and Aaron go before Pharaoh and his magicians, and Aaron's going to take this, you remember, this staff, and he throws it down and it becomes a serpent. Pretty impressive. Well, each man throws down his staff, and they become serpents, but Aaron's ser- uh, serpent ends up swallowing theirs. Still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He's not going to listen, just like the Lord had said. And from this point, it's game on. And now, we come to the first plague. Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, he lifted up the staff, struck the water in the Nile. All the water in the Nile turned into blood. Everything. If you had it in your jars... Pools, small bodies, large bodies, it's all blood. People were having to dig outside by the Nile, dig deep into the ground to try to even find water to drink. But the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret art, so Pharaoh's heart remained hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Eh, my magicians can do it. Nothing new here. Let's keep going. Okay? So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. But the magicians did the same by their secret arts and made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Plead with the Lord to take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go to sacrifice the Lord. Wow, all these frogs everywhere. And I mean everywhere. And his magicians come out and they say, Ha, we can do the same, which almost seems like, you know, you're doing it wrong. You think you'd want to take the frogs away, but instead they just add more frogs to the equation, but okay. But there it is, but it gets old. And and Pharaoh begins to bend for a little bit, that is, until they're gone. But when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them as the Lord 
had said. So we keep going. And Aaron stretched out his hand with the staff and struck the dust of the earth. And there were gnats. And you'll have this. It's hard, it's hard to, to know exactly what these were. Gnats or mosquitoes or flies. They have different, different ideas of exactly what this is. But get the point of what it is. Okay. And all the dust of the earth became gnats in all the land of Egypt. The magicians tried by their secret arts to produce gnats. But now something happens. They can't do it. And so they say this is the finger of of God, and this is a turning point now. We're, we're out. We can't do this. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. If you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people and into your houses, and the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. But on that day I will set apart the land of Goshen, where my people dwell, so that no swarms of flies shall be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Thus I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow the sign shall happen. So now here's the next one, these swarm of flies. And now this is the first time that it's specifically going to be mentioned that his people are set apart. Some people believe that they were all, all, always set apart on these, that they weren't effect, um, affected by this. But I don't know. I don't know about that one. I'm not so sure. But I do know at the very least God is making it a point. Now this one, you're going to see a separation between you and my people. So Pharaoh said, I will let you go to sacrifice the Lord your God. Okay, okay, enough. In the wilderness, only you must not go very far away. Plead for me. Plead for me. Okay, and so Moses goes back again and he pleads and, and God relents. But Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. Game on, we're still going. Behold, the hand of the Lord will fall with a very severe plague upon your livestock that are in the field, the horses, the donkeys, the camels, the herds, and the flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing of all that belongs to the people of Israel shall die. Can you imagine what that would have been like? And Pharaoh sent, and behold, not one of the livestock of Israel was dead, but the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of soot from the kiln, and let Moses throw them in the air in the sight of Pharaoh. He throws it up. Like this ash, basically. Throws it up and boils on everyone and everything. And the magic magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils. For the boils came upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. Uh, magicians, excuse me, and all the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand towards, uh, toward heaven, so that there may be hell in all the land of Egypt, on man and beast and every plant of the field in the land of Egypt. Then Moses stretched out his staff toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hell, and fire ran down to the earth. And the Lord rained hell upon the land of Egypt, like never before and like never would be again. Then Pharaoh sent and called Moses and Aaron and said to them, This time I have sinned. The Lord is in the right, and me and my people are in the wrong. Okay, now we're finally getting through. Nope. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hell and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet again, hardened his heart and his servants. So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh. And he said to them, Go, serve the Lord your God. But which ones are to go? Moses said, We will go with our young and our old. We will go with our sons and daughters and with our flocks and herds, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. He said to them, The Lord be with you if ever I and let you and your little ones go. Look, you have some evil purpose in mind. Nope, not going to do it. So Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and that night. When it was morning, the east wind had brought the locusts. So what happens is this hell kills everything out in the field. 
You're out in the field, you're done. Animals are out in the field, you're done. But it's broken down all these plants and trees and everything. Then on top of that, the locusts come in and they start to feast on everything that is broken but yet still there. So there's remaining like nothing. Then Pharaoh hastily called Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore forgive my sin, please, only this once. And plead with the Lord your God only to remove this death from me. And he does it. And here's, here's what Pharaoh does. He's just, his heart's hardened. So God hardens his heart. And he's not going to let him go. Well, plague number nine. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was pitch darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the people of Israel had light where they lived. Then Pharaoh called Moses and said, Go, serve the Lord. Your little ones also may go with you. Only let your flocks and your herds remain behind. This, I, I, I can only imagine. It's a darkness, it says, that could have been felt. For three days, they could do nothing. And it's kind of comical, I think, about... <laughs> Pharaoh trying to bark orders at Moses in the dark. Go plead with your Lord. Dude, listen. You need to listen up. But for three days. And then here Goshen is, and there's light in Goshen. Have fun figuring that one out. But he did it. I always thought this was, this was the most memorable one for me that always stuck. But the Lord... Harden Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, Get away from me. Take care never to see my face again. For on the day you see my face, you shall die. Moses said, As you say, I will not see your face again. But before, before Moses walks out in this setting, sometimes the transition from chapter 11 to 12 can seem confusing, like Moses goes away and then he's talking to him again. What happens is it just fast forwards a little bit, gives you information, but it finishes what, what happens as Moses is in front of him. And so there's one more plague. There's one more threat that he has. And here it is. So Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the, uh, of the cattle. There shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as... There has never been, nor ever will be again. But not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. And all these, your servants, shall come down to me and bow down to me, saying, Get out, you and all the people who follow you, and after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt." And brethren, what happened is these destroying angels and the destroyer comes through, as the text says. Destroyer comes through. And those that were not obedient to God, death occurred to the firstborn male. And I can only imagine what, would it, what it would have sounded that evening as you heard the first, the second, the many cries. As you look for those that, not, that did not obey God, the cries were coming from you because there was not one house that did not have a death. And I imagine what that would have been like, try to my mind, for these Hebrew brethren to listen and to hear outside their own walls the multitude of cries growing louder and louder and how terrible that would have been. And so, he summons Moses and Aaron by night and said, Up! Go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. And, and it's sad, because Pharaoh does what Pharaoh did best. He hardened his heart again, and then he took after God's people again. And, and the eeriness of his statement that the next time you see me, you shall die. Well, death occurred, but it wasn't Moses. And the next time that he saw God's people would be as he's chasing them through the waters of the sea. 
And God is victorious over this hard-hardened Pharaoh. Thank you for your patience. I, I, I wanted to, to kind of quickly run through this so you could have your eyes and, and your thoughts on what this looked like. I have just a couple of, of points, and then this is yours. Lessons to learn. Brethren, it's not about me. First and foremost, it's not about me. Something that I, that I realized for the first time ever reading through these passages. See, let's see what stands out to you. Chapter 7, verse 17. I'm going to go really fast here. Chapter 7, verse 17. This is the, the, the water turned to blood section. Thus says the Lord, For this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall turn into blood. What did you recognize? What stands out to you? For most of us, the fact that he just said that he's going to strike the Nile and it's going to turn into blood, I, I, I want to submit to you that that's not what they're supposed to pick up from this. You know what they're supposed to understand? I'm the Lord. Chapter 8 Verse 9, with the plague with the frogs, Moses said to Pharaoh, Be pleased to command me when I am to plead for you and for your servants and for your people that the frogs be cut off from you and from your houses be left only in the, uh, your houses and be left only in the Nile. And he said, Tomorrow, Moses said, Be as it as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. The reason why this is going to happen, that you will know that there's no one like Jehovah. Look at verse 8 and 22, or chapter 8, verse 22, in the plague of the flies. But on that day I will set apart the land of Goshen, where my people dwell, so that swarms of flies shall be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth, or the, the, the Lord that is, in the, that is on the earth, in the earth. I'm here. That's what you're supposed to take notice of, Pharaoh. Look at chapter 9, verse 15. And 16, the plague of hail. For by now I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, and you have been cut off from the earth. But for this purpose I have raised you up to show you my power, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. I'm going to do this so that you know who I am and know how powerful I am, and that others are going to hear about it. Verse 29. Moses said to him, As soon as I have gone out of the city, I will stretch out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease, and there will be no more hell, so that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. Not only is he in the earth, is he over the earth, but let's make it clear, it's his. That was the point. Look at chapter 10, verse 2. And that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your grandson how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians, and what signs I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. Not only am I going to show this signs, but Moses, your children are going to learn something from this. That I save my people, that I am the Lord. And look at what I have done. And look at chapter 11, verse 7. But not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel in this final plague, either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. The reality is, as you go through all these plagues and you ask, what was the purpose? I just gave it to you. That's what God was trying to communicate to Pharaoh. I am the Lord. There's no one else beside me. I am all-powerful. I am in the land. I am over the land. My children will know that I freed them. And people will know, everyone will know, that there's a, a distinction between those who are mine and those who are not. Pharaoh, that's what you need to understand. You know, from a Jewish point of view, you got these cool stories. Our God, Jehovah, our Yahweh, is the one who flooded the earth. 
And then specifically our people. Our God is the one who took our people and saved them. Let me tell you, these people were a stubborn people. (laughs) They were a very stubborn people. This story was God's story. And something we need to learn that at the end of the day, even though all these good things that God has done for us, it's not about you and your story. It's about His story. I believe. Something else, people are stubborn. And I put like, like really stubborn. <laughs> Look at chapter 9. In chapter 9, this plague of the hell, God warns them, 19 through 21, He's giving them a chance to get themselves and their li- livestock out of harm's way. And those who feared the Lord, the text says, listened to him. I'm not talking about the Hebrew, car- Hebrew congregation. The Egyptians. There are some that listen. Listen, in, in chapter 10, verse 3 Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Hebrews, Hebrews, of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. How long, Pharaoh, are you going to keep doing this? I'm sorry, but don't tell me that he was just destined to go to hell. God's not playing with Pharaoh. He had total free will. Pharaoh, how long are you going to keep doing this? You know what's even uh, uh, salt to the wound? As you continue on, His own servants come to him. Look, verse 7. Pharaoh's servants said to him, How long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not yet understand that Egypt is ruined? Brethren, God is communicating to us today and is communicating through his word. And God is pleading with us. If we're struggling this morning with rebellion against him, How long are you going to keep doing this? Brethren may be coming to you and talking to you. How long shall this go on? Is your life not being destroyed because of this? Is this not having mass repercussions on those you love? How long are you going to keep doing this? And we're a stubborn people many times. And we think that, you know what? Maybe I'll just wait around until I'm just really humbled, because that makes a lot of sense. But what you learn through this is that even if God hit you with ten plagues, people don't listen. We can be such a stubborn people, and it takes more than lip service. You caught, I'm sure, in chapter 9, verse 27. This time, Pharaoh says, I've sinned. The Lord is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. Chapter 10, verse 16 and 17. He calls Moses and Aaron. I've sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore forgive my sin. Please, only this once, and plead with the Lord your God only to remove this death from me. Brethren, here's what doesn't cut it. It, What doesn't cut it is having this moment where you feel bad. This moment where you feel sad. Even this moment where you say something really profound. I am the man. David said the same thing. Why is David different than Pharaoh? Because Pharaoh didn't repent. It's not good enough to say, I've sinned against the Lord. Don't pay me lip service. Repent. But is not the real goal here in trusting and acknowledging God? Like, that's the problem with all of this. Why are you still leaning on your own understanding? It doesn't make any sense. But you know, Pharaoh would say all these things, but chapter 9, 34, and 35 is just a good snapshot that sums him up. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hell and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet again and hardened his heart, he and his servants. So the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people of Israel go, just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. Many times we're going through difficult times, and we feel really bad, and we just want the bad stuff to go away. So then for a moment we're humbled, and we plea out to, to the Lord. But after everything's nice and fine, all of a sudden, who is the Lord that you speak of? What is this righteous standard? What is this holiness? I don't know. And what kind of faith is it to where God has to be as honest all the time? To just force us into submission. He's not going to force you into submission. At some point, God's going to let go. And then he's going to let you make a decision. And, and thank you, God, for being that way. 
for being such a good and wonderful father in that way. And you know, it makes sense why Stephen called the Jews such a stiff-necked people. And he killed for it. <laughs> this wasn't just an Egyptian deal, and it wasn't just a Jewish deal. It can just be a people deal. And it can happen with me, and it can, it can happen with you. Do you want to be separated? Here's another lesson. Again, you know, as you go through all these passages, you're going to see all these distinctions that are made with, uh, with these swarms and the insects and the hell and the darkness. And it's really cool, right? you got all these distinctions that are being made between uh, God's people and them. And, it, and I mean, it is, and it's really, I mean, it is supposed to be really powerful, and there's even some, some excitement about it. But, um, but brethren, understand this. Goshen Christianity, if you will, it's not about just life being easy and being comfortable. I, I think actually they were suffering along with those first initial plagues with them. And I got to tell you, if they did, that's okay, because God was trying to make a point about himself. And then if he decided to separate his people to further that point, I'm okay with that too. Sometimes we suffer with the world, sometimes we don't. But, but you know, what's interesting to me, that the final plague... God's people had a responsibility. I want you to think about that, especially in that one. Even though they were his people, if they were not obedient, if they didn't take the lamb, spread the blood, if they didn't go inside and do as he told them to do, the destroyer would come on them as well. It really wasn't just about them only. If you want to be separated, understand this, so do I. But I wanted to be separated for the purpose of God. I want to live for him because I'm his child and we're all trying to tell people again about him. And in this life, I may suffer with, with others, but that's okay because I'm going home one day. That's all right with me because I know that what he did is that he saved me from spiritual darkness. He saved me from slavery. I was in Satan's hands and he ripped me loose from that. And that's why we say this world is not my home because we are on a different plane than everyone else. And finally, brethren, with that in mind, it's not even just about us either, is it? You know, so whenever these people were, to, were going to leave, they would plunder their neighbors. They were in Goshen. There were Egyptians, actually, that still lived close with them. What's interesting, in chapter 12, verse 38, whenever they flee, whenever they leave, there's a, mul there's a mixed congregation. Now, I've got to tell you, I, I like this. I like this part of the story. And what you have here is, I believe, I believe is, yeah, you would have had some people that perhaps earlier on had perhaps already been um, uh, with some of the Israelites, but I, I think some of the Egyptians left with them. <laughs> I think some of those people saw what was going on, and they humbled themselves, and they feared the Lord, and they listened to the word, and they got out of Dodge with God's people. And you and I have this great opportunity while we're here as Goshen Christians, if you will, that we persevere leaning on Him, and our hope is that other people will come with us. Amen? And so I want you to think about this this week as we're going about. Number one, it's about God, not about me. It's about God, not about me. Soften my heart. These, these, these sins that you may be caught up in, and that you won't let go, I promise you two things. Number one, it leads to hell. Sorry. But it does. And number two, you're going to enjoy the relationship with the Father much better once you quit fighting Him. I promise you that. Number three, remember that you're a light out there. It's not about your comfort. It's about glorifying God, and it's about being obedient. It's about being holy for God is holy, which brings us to number four, because there's also people around us that are in this darkness still today, brethren. Very real. It's no different. 
they are in darkness this week. Someone that you see this week is in this darkness. Do what you can, your little part. Try to get them home with you. Hope this has been an encouragement to you. So, we've heard God's story. What's yours? <laughs> and by that I mean, what's the excuse? Why, why wait? He's given you today. It's a time to humble yourselves before Him. A time to repent of your sin. A time to confess that you know who's Lord, not me, but Jesus Christ is. And it's by His grace that He was buried and crucified. You want to talk about three days of darkness, brethren. I know a man that was three days in the ground and was raised to bring me life. That's the one that I trust in. And you can be united with Him in His death. And you can be resurrected to walk in a newness of life through an act of faith and baptism. We ask that you come forward as together we stand and we sing.